Nomos puts the Y in date, Jaeger Lecultra does a reverso on case sizes, and Omega calls first for a second time. It's episode 91 of A Week in Watches, a bi-weekly look back at new releases and interesting stories from the watch industry. I'm Zach Weiss, the wall behind me is now gray, and I'll be your host. It's October, finally, which means the watch world is back to operating at full steam and I get to wear light jackets again. But perhaps most importantly, it means that Wind Up Watch Fair in New York City is just around the corner. With over 130 brands representing 16 countries, we're fairly certain that this year's Wind Up Watch Fair in New York City is the biggest watch fair in the world. Come see many of your favorite brands like Christopher Ward, Bulova, and Fortis, as well as discover brands you've never seen before. This year's fair runs from October 18th to 20th and is being held at 415 Fifth Avenue. As always, it's free and open to the public, so bring your friends, families, and dogs. Be sure to say hi if you stop in and check out windupwatchfair.com for a full brand list and greater details. Nomos doubles down on dates. In an industry first and possibly last, Nomo decided to get playful with the idea of the date complication on their newest Tangente watch. Before getting to it, I feel like a touch of context is needed. Nomos, Glass Huta's quirky and well-loved maker of modern, design-forward watches, has never been scared of a bit of whimsy. From their use of color, like on the recent 31 flavors of their Tengente, to some of their layouts, like the still unique Metro Date Power Reserve, to overall designs like their Autobahn model, which never really quite caught on, Nomos has shown that they can balance fun while also offering conservative pieces with more mass-market appeal. Well, at their fifth annual forum, which was held at the end of September, they revealed a new caliber and sort of a new complication, though also not really. Called the Tangente 2 date, at a glance, one will notice the prominent date window at six, as well as another track of apertures studying the circumference of the dial. If you're familiar with their catalog, you'll be aware that this is the same date system used on their Metro and Tangente Neomatic 41 models. But what information is it giving here? When I first saw an image of the watch, I assumed, wrongly, that this would indicate the month, but that quickly dissolved as I counted the windows. Nope, it's still the date. So yes, the two date shows the same date twice, but in two methods. One digital, and the other as a graphic pointer. The idea, I suppose, being that one is exact and the other more poetic, at a glance showing your position in the month. Is this needed? Is this something people have asked for? Well, I somehow doubt. But I'll, I'll go back to what I said at the beginning. Nomos is not scared of a bit of whimsy or fun, and perhaps even of trolling us just a little bit. And what they are really doing is showing off the date mechanism of their new movement, the DUW4601. A manual movement that seems to be based on their base manual movement, the DUW4301, it features some internal upgrades, new plate and balance cock design, some eye-catching finishing, and of course, a new date module. The DUW4601 features a 52-hour power reserve up from 42, a first for the brand, I believe, and 23 joules up from 17, likely accounting for the date mechanism. The three-quarter plate has been slightly redesigned, allowing for a larger and more elegant balance cock design with a small amount of skeletonization. Rather than standard striping, Nomos opted for sunburst striping emanating from the center of the balance, a very appealing design also seen on their Lambda and Lux models. The striping covers not just the main plate and balance cock, but also the peripheral date mechanism, which sits around the movement, almost like a holder. A patented design, I believe, Nomos has been using peripheral dates for a while, as they allow for the movement to stay thin, but at the cost of width. With that said, they are still able to make the Tangente 2 date an appealing 37.5 millimeters. The Tangente 2 date comes in a white silver with black markers and red dates, and sunburst blue with white markers and dates. Both cost $3,020. Look, when I first saw these watches and realized what they did, I thought, well, oh, this is ridiculous. And well, they kind of are, but now that the shock has faded, I do think they are nice looking. They are Tangentes after all. Had the external date been a month or even 52 week calendar, I'd be seriously considering them. As for what they are, well, at least the novelty will likely not be repeated. So they have that going for them. Jaeger Lecultra has people flipping over their new reversos. The Jaeger Lecultra Reverso is one of the more iconic platforms in existence. Though originally designed to be worn while playing polo, the clever Art Deco case that features a reversible dial construction, allowing a protected steel side to face out during sports, oozes elegance, making them a go-to for the sartorial inclined 
and those who need something for more formal occasions. A watch line with many faces, both literally and figuratively, as the Reverso concept is built around the case, the brand has been able to play widely with dials and movements, creating watches ranging in style, complexity, and price. Their newest releases being a great example of this, extending from their entry for mechanical up to a hot creation. I'll preface this with saying that I got to borrow these watches for a few days, and they left an impression. Let's start in reverse order, from priciest to least, as that feels appropriate given this specific line of watches, with the Reverso Tribute Duoface Torbjorn in steel. While not a new watch per se, rather a watch that came out last year, now in steel, the Duoface Torbjorn shows off the power of the Reverso concept. A watch with two personalities, one side is a classic Reverso layout with a gray metallic surface, applied faceted indices, railroad index, and Dauphine hands. Of course, there is a proportionally large tourbillon window at 6, adding that hot touch. This is the reserved side, the business side, if you will. Flipping the dial over, you are presented with a far more modern and exotic take on a tourbillon. A full metal affair built on the back of the movement, an engine turned Clou de Paris surface studded with pivot points and screws, a smaller hour and minute display sits north of center, making room for an even larger tourbillon aperture, which now includes a large bridge and a rotating seconds disc. There's also a small 24 hour display in the top right corner with sun and moon illustrations. Needless to say, this is the party side. Measuring 45.5 by 27.4 by 9.15 millimeters, the Duoface Tourbillon is one of the most sublime watches I've put on my wrist in some time. Relatively compact and thin, but wonderfully complicated and just great looking. And it's two watches in one, with a dual time setting, allowing the two faces to have different hours, which adds an immeasurable cool factor. Unfortunately for me, this watch costs over $100,000, so it will remain in the realm of dream watches for now. Next is another entry into the duo face category, the Tribute duo face Small Seconds in Rose Gold. Like the Torbjorn, one side features the classic Proverso design, here rendered in a deep sunray lacquer blue with rose gold accents and a Small Seconds at six. The flip side stays formal, but with a different layout featuring overlapping circular cutouts, one for the hour and minute, another for a 24 hour dial, all in sunray silver surfaces. Golden beam markers emanate out of the hour and minutes for a dramatic look. Coming in at 25,500, this one is a bit more down to earth in price, but no less decadent. Having worn this for a little while, I have to say it particularly fell for the contrast between the silver side, which was bright and energetic, and the inky blue of the flip side which had a more reserved, demure feeling. I feel like if you own this, you just sit and flip it around all day. I saved the most talked about for last. While the previous two were certainly eye-catching, the Reverso Tribute Monoface brings back a close approximation of the original Reverso case size from 1931. Measuring 40.1 by 24.4 by 7.56 millimeters, they are pleasantly small and quite thin, but being rectangular, not quite as small as they sound, still having plenty of wrist presence. The Tribute Monofaces are two-handers, once again with that classic Reverso layout of a railroad index, applied faceted markers, and Dauphine hands. Clean and traditional, there are two models at launch, both in steel. One has a silver opaline dial, which appears like a cool matte white, and a sunray blue, which has a metallic sheen and a touch more depth than the white. Both are priced at $8,900. I've never owned a Reverso, but every time I try one on, I think, why don't I? They have a singular charm, and the novelty of the flipping case, especially on duo face models, would make them stand out in a collection. Any Reverso fans out there, let us know what you think of these new models, especially the new Monoface. Another Tuesday, another new Speedy. The CK2998 reference Speedmaster, first released in 1959, was famously worn by astronaut Wally Shira on October 3rd, 1962, when he orbited the Earth six times on the Mercury Atlas 8 mission, earning it the title of the first Omega in space. Unlike the famous Moonwatch, the CK2998 featured a straight lug case without crown guards and alpha hands, giving it a dis different and perhaps more delicate look than the iconic Moonwatch. To celebrate this milestone and design in 2012, Omega brought the CK2998 back as the Speedmaster first Omega in space. Measuring 39.7 millimeters, it offered a smaller and more vintage flavored option to the lineup. Though one could argue all Speedmasters are vintage flavored, but whatever. It was a popular model that spawned a few limited editions in its time, which ended about four years ago. Well, it's back and better than ever. 
or the same, I, I don't know. But it did receive some refinements after its absence. Between 2012 and now, Omega and most other brands learned a lot about what it means to revive a vintage design. Whereas before, more liberties were taken with details, now they try to get things as true as possible to the source material. But Omega still had a little fun. The second first Omega in space, as Zakazan named it, also measures 39.7 millimeters and features straight lugs, but with a slightly different shape than the previous version, which had a more uh, aggressive chamfer. The bezel features the period correct dot above 90, and the dial is now stepped, which is also correct as well as a slight visual improvement in my eyes. It's also 0.6 millimeters thinner, which never hurts. Other changes include a new crystal that, while sapphire more closely resembles the shape of the original acrylic box, TBD on whether it creates the same halo as the previous sapphire. The case back also got a redo in the form of simplification, which is nice to see. Rather than a deep engraving, which most definitely would have left an imprint on the wrist, a relatively light engraving is used. While one could see this as a cheaper option, I just find it more elegant. But perhaps the most notable visual difference is that of the blue-gray dial, recreating a color found on some vintage examples. I know that's vague, but that's the information they gave. It's a deep midnight blue that touches on black and has a sunray finish for a metallic sheen. It's undoubtedly nice looking and makes this version of the first Omega in space stand out even a little more from other speedies. There's also a lot of rusty Fotina used on the markers and hands. I'm sure this is divisive as Fotina always is, and I'm a bit on the fence about it too. Something is appealing to these watches being like new CK2998, thus no Fotina, rather than just crispy vintage examples, which as we all know can feel a bit fake. But the color also looks good with the blue-gray. Of course, inside the second first Omega in space is the 3861 manual wound chronograph movement. Unveiled a few years ago, it's a coaxial master chronometer, so as modern as it gets. Overall, I think this is a pretty solid offering for the speedy enthusiasts and a proper return of a model that was popular but retired. Coming in at 7,500 on a strap or 7,900 on a bracelet, the new first Omega in space is available now. And with that, episode 91 of A Week in Watches reaches its conclusion. Once again, I hope to see you at Wind Up Watch Fair in New York City, October 18th through 20th at 415 Fifth Avenue. It's going to be an amazing time. Please like and subscribe if you'd be so kind, and we'll see you next time.